Father, thank you so much for your word. Holy Spirit, thank you for your work in our lives. And tonight we entrust ourselves to you, our minds, our hearts, our bodies. Would you bring revelation, Holy Spirit, of who the Father is, of who Jesus is? Would you transform us tonight as we study your word? And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm really excited that uh, we're starting a new book, and I love the Gospels. Does anybody know what gospel means? So there's, a couple good, there's a couple really good reasons to get excited about the Gospels. The first is just the definition, which, as somebody has said, is good news. That's what gospel means, good news. Uh, so reason enough to be excited about where we are tonight. But secondly, um, I don't know growing up if you have ever wrestled with the question, what is God really like? And especially as you try to develop a relationship with God, and particularly you think about, man, God is not someone I can physically see. And so when we talk about relationship with God, I think uh, initially that can be a daunting and concerning thing because we're used to relationships with people that we can see face to face, that we can spend time with, that we can hear audibly, that we can sit next to, that we can ask questions. And so when we start to talk about having a relationship with God, who is spirit that we have never seen, I don't know about any of you, but have you walked through periods of your relationship trying to develop with God? That, it's daunting. You're like, what is God really even like? Well, one of, my, one of the most exciting reasons for us to study the Gospels is, uh, I, I remember this when I went to go to a, a school of biblical studies, and one of the first, when we got to the first Gospel, uh, the teacher said this, and I'll, just, and I'll do this with you. He says, close your eyes. Close your eyes. I want you to picture God. What, what does God look like? What does God look like? And I remember sitting there going, like, is it? Is he light? You know, he's spirit. What is it? And, he, and then what he said is he says, you should see Jesus. You should see Jesus. When you wonder who, who is God, what does God look like, you can open your eyes. You should see Jesus. And so one of the most exciting reasons for us to study the Gospels is because it gives us a picture of who Jesus is. It gives a very... Uh, it, it, so many stories, so many narratives, so many conversations, so many things that reveal the heart of who God is. And I think that that is instrumental to us taking steps about how we develop our relationship with God. So a couple good reasons to get really excited about starting Mark. Let's talk about Mark specifically. So a little uh, you know, Bible quiz. You've got four Gospels. What are they? you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but we always think that the Gospels were probably written by the disciples. That's just kind of our assumption. You know, the Gospels were written by people that hung out with Jesus, the disciples who were with him all the time. But the reality is only two of the four Gospels were written by disciples. And they are what? Who are the two that hung out with him? Matthew and John. and John. So that makes you go, well, Mark, Luke, how did we get those Gospels? And so, um, you know, we always think about Paul writing, we say Paul wrote most of the New Testament, which he did write a lot of books as far as the number of books, but probably really close to Paul as far as quantity, like number of verses written, is actually Luke, Dr. Luke. And that's because he not only wrote Luke, but he also wrote Acts. Luke and Acts are kind of a part one, part two to a guy named Theophilus. Most likely, or very possibly, uh, it, they were written as an account to be a record that when Paul went before Caesar for Christianity to be tried, that these books were written for him to take as documents to explain what Christianity was all about. And so Luke was not somebody who hung out with Jesus. He wasn't one of the disciples. So all of his stories are by interviews. Luke like interviewed everybody and then wrote the gospel based on these interviews. Now he did, uh, he did connect with Paul and a lot of the journeys that Paul went on, Luke was a part of those. 
That's what we call the we passages in Acts. We went here, we went there, and that's Luke is a part of that. But for a lot of that content, it was all interviews. So that leads us to the last gospel, which ironically, the last gospel we're talking about was the first gospel written, which is Mark. And you kind of go, well, how did we get the gospel of Mark? Well, the gospel of Mark is actually, as far as like timeline, it is the first gospel written. And it was probably written around 63 AD. It was during the reign of a guy by the name of Nero. Anybody here ever hear about Nero? Nero, uh, he, there are lots of stories about Nero. He was a little twisted in the head. He was very full of himself. He thought he was divine. He persecuted Christians. Uh, this is the guy who uh, was not very happy with like whole swaths of Rome. So he set them on fire so that he could rebuild what he wanted. And while he set Rome on fire, they say that he like raced around his gardens in his chariot naked. So, I mean, he just had... The guy was missing some screws or he had some extra screws that went in too tight, one or the other, but there were just some things that were off about the guy. Nonetheless, great persecution broke out across the whole Roman Empire, but particularly in Rome because that's where Nero hung out. And when you're saying that you're a god and you expect everybody to worship you, Christianity is competition. And so as persecution continued to rise then there began to be a need to be able to tell the stories about Jesus and put them on paper. And so that's how Mark was birthed. It was birthed out of persecution in Rome. Now the question is, who's Mark? You know, how did he, if he wasn't one of the disciples, who was he? Well, do you guys remember the story about Jesus the night of when he's getting ready for the Passover before he goes to the cross and he's like, hey, I want you to go to this town and you're going to find a guy with a pot on his head. Do you guys remember this story? And they're like, follow this guy and where he goes, go and say, hey, the master wants to use your house for dinner. Well, it's, it's kind of speculated that that guy actually might have been Mark. And as you follow the thread through the, all of the gospels, uh, Mark kind of leaves his little signature, so to speak, in this book in chapter 14, where it says that when Jesus, after the meal that they had for the Passover, they went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And as they went out to the Garden of Gethsemane, all of the soldiers showed up to arrest Jesus. And there's this weird verse in like 51 or 52. And it says, and there was a young man that they grabbed, that the soldiers grabbed, but that they grabbed his cloak and he ran away into the night naked. So kind of Bible's first streaker. And, but this is his signature. And so the question is, well, what, what, is that, what, what was going on there? Well, most likely the, the house that Jesus had the Passover meal in before he died was Mark's house. His mom's name was Mary and it happened there. And so he was probably asleep late at night, 10 or 11. Here's them all go out. They're going to the Garden of Gethsemane. He wraps up in a robe real quick, follows them. Everything goes haywire, and he runs off in the night. This story continues with him. Do you remember a story in Acts where Peter gets arrested, and he's in jail getting ready to be killed because Herod had killed James, and so he saw that that pleased everybody. So he's like, I'm going to arrest Peter next. Takes Peter, puts him in jail. While Peter is sleeping, an angel comes in the night, wakes him up, and takes him out of the jail. You guys remember this in Acts? Well, guess whose house he goes to? Mary's house, John Mark's house. And so he's knocking on the door, and of course there's the humorous thing where she leaves him at the door out in the street, you know, going to tell everybody, Peter's at the door. No, let, let him in. He's out of jail trying to hide, you know, for his life. So we, we continue to see that this was probably a house that was in Jerusalem that was kind of the intersection of a lot of things that happened, not only for the Passover meal, but for many of the disciples. 
And as a result of this, John Mark happens to be one of the guys that goes on Paul's first missionary journey. And so we find this in Acts chapter 12, where Barnabas and Paul, God sets them apart. They're praying and fasting, and the Lord says, set me apart, Barnabas and Paul. They're going to do a work for me. And so they go, and they're going to go on this first missionary journey. And Barnabas happens to have a cousin whose name is, guess who? Mark, John Mark. And so they start this missionary journey, and uh, they go from a place called Antioch, which has kind of become the, the central place of where Christianity is really exploding. It's moved from Jerusalem to Antioch. And as the church is exploding there and they send this team out, they go right across over to Cyprus. It's the very first place that they go to on Paul and Barnabas' missionary journey. And it's like a crazy thing. You, you, you find out that when they first go, Barnabas is essentially leading this team. It says Barnabas and Saul were the ones that were going. And Barnabas and Saul. And Barnabas and Saul did this. Well, at their first encounter, they end up meeting the guy who's like the magistrate over that period, over that area. And the Lord begins to use Paul really powerfully, where there's a magician that this magistrate is listening to and trying to consult. And this guy is trying to um, lead him away to not hear the gospel. And Paul looks at this guy and he says, what you're doing is of the devil and you're gonna be blind. And the guy goes blind. Now I just want you to stop and think for a second. How did the Lord meet Paul? Remember when, the Lord, remember when the Lord met Saul? He's going to Damascus and he's like persecuting people. What did the Lord do with Saul? He blinded him. So it's kind of like what happened in Paul's life he kind of says, well, this is what's happening. You know, they share the gospel and then they go from there to go up to Asia Minor. And it says at that point that John Mark abandoned ship. And we don't know why. We don't know if it's because after that point where this thing happens in Cyprus, all of a sudden it's not Barnabas and Saul anymore. All of a sudden the name is changed from Saul to Paul which Paul is his Greek name. You know, it's not like there was some kind of a spiritual encounter and you are now Paul or something like that. It wasn't like that. It was that Saul was his Hebrew name, but, Paul, but Saul was a apostle to who? The Gentiles. So he's gonna take the Gentile name of Paul to be able to relate to them. And so from that time on, it's no longer Barnabas and Saul. All of a sudden, the storylines begin talking about Paul and Barnabas. So we don't know what happened. We don't know if things got too hard for Mark. We don't know if he got bent out of shape because cousin Barnabas was leading the team and now all of a sudden there's a change in leadership. We don't know if he got sick. We don't know what happened. But the next time we pick up the story is in Acts 15, which is kind of the epic chapter in Acts. It is the the massive problem of the New Testament. It's called the Jerusalem Council. And the question was whether or not, see what happened is up to this point, everybody who'd become Christians were Jews. So there was no issue with that because you were a Jew and you followed all the rules. You ate a certain way, there were things you didn't eat, you went to temple, you sacrificed, but now you believed in Jesus. Well, all of a sudden the gospel starts breaking out and now people who are not Jews are getting saved. So there's all these Gentiles who are coming to Christ. But all the Jews who have come to Christ are like, well, if you really want to follow Jesus, you can't eat bacon anymore. You know, and they were probably like, what? <laughs> you know, and they're like, and you need to, uh, you know, observe our holidays, the Day of Atonement and Hanukkah and all of that. And they're like, what? And they said, oh, and by the way, you need to get circumcised. And they're like, what? <laughs> you know? And so there began to be this huge thing. And, and, and it was like knocked down, drag out. And so everybody in Antioch's like, we got to go to Jerusalem and figure this out. And so they go to Jerusalem and there's this, what's called the Jerusalem Council. And the Holy Spirit shows up because it is like this unsolvable problem. 
Because when you look at it from the Old Testament, circumcision, even in Scripture, says this was an eternal covenant. This was a, co- a covenant that wasn't to be changed. It was an eternal covenant. And all of the other things, and all of a sudden through Paul and Barnabas sharing what Christ had done, something happened between all of them that they decided, you know what, Gentiles don't need to become Jews. They just need to follow Jesus. But they need to observe some things. They can't, they need to observe the the eating things. They don't need to eat like Jews, but they need to not cause, cause their Jewish brothers to stumble. They can't eat meat with blood. They need to live pure lives sexually, not stumble. You can't take on the you know, all of the, the morals of people who aren't following Jesus that's still there, but you don't need to be circumcised. You don't need to eat certain things. You don't need to keep those, those Jewish festivals. And so there's the, I mean, it was like this, Holy Spirit, unexpected, miraculous coming together, solving this problem in Acts 15. And then at the end of Acts 15, there's another weird thing. Paul and Barnabas said, hey, let's go back and visit those churches we went to on our first missionary journey. They're like, yeah, that's a great idea. And Barnabas was like, I want to take John Mark again. And Paul said, "Uh uh-uh, this guy's not fit for ministry. He abandoned us. And it says that the contention became so sharp that they separated. And Paul began to go with Silas and Barnabas went with Mark And the rest of Acts, you don't hear about Barnabas and Mark. You only hear about Paul and Silas. So, hmm, things that make you go, hmm. So all of a sudden, what happens after that? I mean, honestly, if you think about it, how do you come back from like really messing up with Paul? You know, when Paul's not willing to take you on the team, that is not good. You know, when he's like so adamant that he's not only not coming on the team, but if you want him on the team, you're not on my team. You know, and there's been lots of conversations about who was right, who was wrong. I think they were both right. I think they were both wrong. But the, but the way that that chapter is set up, there's, there's no mistaking that they have the Jerusalem conflict that gets solved, this impossible thing. And then something that should have been solved doesn't get solved. And John Mark is left out in the cold. So from there, if you read 1 Peter, which Peter writes, what church tradition tells us is guess where John Mark ends up? He ends up in Rome. And he ends up with Rome working with Peter. In fact, when you read 1 Peter, at the end of that in chapter 5, He says, and he's giving greetings, and he says, my son Mark gives you greetings. So it was kind of like the relationship Paul had with Timothy, Peter had with Mark. Now this is so God, because I want you to think about this. If there was one guy who knows about coming back from failure, who is it? It's Peter. I mean, how do you come back from denying Jesus swearing and and your eyes meet while it's happening and he's predicted that you're going to deny him three times and you say I'll die before it happens and then he catches you in the act while you're like cussing and swearing that you don't know him how do you come back from that but you know what Peter had experienced the restoration of God in John 21 do you love me do you love me you love me? You know, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. And so I think Peter was probably one of the greatest people that John Mark could go to hang out to figure out what do I do with this this failure in my life? And then as you continue to read the letters of Paul, we find that that relationship is restored. That Paul mentions Mark several times in Colossians, Philemon, in fact, in Timothy, he, uh, he says, you know, tell Mark he's useful for the ministry. And so this, this relationship is restored. So Mark is hanging out with Peter in Rome. He's essentially his interpreter. 
So all of Peter's sermons, Mark's interpreting. And as persecution is arising in Rome, something happens where Mark, that the Lord puts it on Mark's heart that he needs to put this to parchment. And isn't it ironic, I don't know about you, but this is such a beautiful picture of restoration and how God can restore in our lives and how he loves us, that here at one point you think Mark bails, is completely ostracized from Paul and writes the first gospel. Isn't that cool? It's so cool. And so, but, but part of this as we jump into Mark is these are, these are the stories of Peter. These are the sermons of Peter. Now, other than Jesus, Peter is the most mentioned person in the Gospels. And so some of that is probably just because of Peter's personality. You know, Peter's kind of that larger than life say what everybody's thinking, but nobody's willing to say, you know, Peter's the guy that you got to love because he's just, he just puts it all out there. But I also think that there's something about that, that, that number of mentions of Peter is not only about his bigger than life personality, his speaking out, his leadership, but I also think it points to the depth of relationship he had with Jesus. You know, we know that he was one of the inner three with, with Peter, James, and John. So he was around for a lot of things that other people weren't around for. And so what I want to start out tonight in chapter one is I want for us to observe what did it look like for Peter to start following Jesus? And... Because Peter had this unique relationship with Jesus, this depth of relationship, I think it's, I don't know about you, but when, when there's something I want to find out about how to do something or I want to do something well, I don't want to just like go to school for it. I want to talk to somebody who's done it. I want to talk to somebody who's been there. I want, I want to talk to somebody who's got experience. I want somebody who is like, lived enough of it that they can not just tell me like the general principles, but that they can tell me the inside scoop. You know what I mean? That they can tell me the stories that nobody else has. You know what I'm talking about? So that is kind of what Mark is. Mark is the stories of Jesus. And think about there's probably stories that you tell about first going to a school, first coming to a job, first playing a sport, first going, you know, whatever your firsts are. And we tell these stories to each other, don't we? We're like, and I didn't know what was going on, and then this happened, and it was like, wow. And, and so you tell, and so t the, today in chapter, tonight in chapter one, we're gonna get some of that. We're gonna get some of, what would it have been like for where, whatever life Peter had before Jesus how that was radically changed as he came to encounter who Jesus was. But I think that what's worth us looking at is not only do we, do we listen to that or pay attention to that because of the stories, but hopefully that helps us follow Jesus. Because I want to go back to the beginning premise. Why are we excited to be in the gospel? Well, first of all, it's good news. But second of all, it tells us who God is. So if we can learn how Peter developed relationship with God, maybe there are some things we can learn about developing relationship with God. It'd be worth paying attention to. Does that make sense? Okay, so we all on the same page? Two of the gospels, one of them's Mark, he's the first. Coming back from failure, first gospel written, wow! Peter's stories, and that's where we pick up in chapter one. Now, verse, we're going to pick up in verse 14. 1 through 13 <clears throat> essentially talks about John the Baptist coming on the scene and him heralding or telling that Jesus is going to come. From Mark's perspective, being in Rome, he's writing to Romans. It's kind of an action gospel. The word immediately or forthright 
is used 41 times, so it's like, this is happening, and then this is happening. It's, it's an action gospel. Well, that's because that would appeal to the Roman mind. Romans were very action-oriented. They you know, paved roads over the world, Pax Romana, they ruled with force. They were into getting things done. And so Mark is writing to this kind of a person. And in that context, if Caesar was to go anywhere, they would always send a herald before him to say, hey, Caesar's coming, make way, pay respects. And so he starts this with the exact thing that Romans would expect, that if a king is coming, and he certainly presents Jesus as the king, he starts with talking about John the Baptist and saying John came to tell the king is coming. The king is coming. And so 1 through 13 is about John the Baptist saying the king is coming and that Jesus, and it's the story of Jesus' baptism and then him going to the wilderness to be tempted. Now, he doesn't go into as much detail as Luke or Matthew does, which that's kind of its own sermon, but um, that's kind of what's happened up to 1.14. Okay, so let's pick it up in 1.14. <clears throat> First off, though, we start with kind of the official public ministry of Jesus beginning. But how did Jesus' ministry really begin? It began with an obedience to baptism. And did Jesus need to be baptized in the sense of confessing sin? No, he did not. And yet he still submitted to baptism. So I don't know if you've been baptized, but I do want to say it's important because it's a public confession of what God has done in an inward thing. And if Jesus submitted to that, we should be willing to do the same. If he's willing to walk in obedience to that, we should be willing to walk in obedience to that. So as he's baptized, that's his first public act, you would think that after he's baptized and, and God audibly speaks, wow, I mean, don't we all say we want that? God audibly speaks, you would think, all right, he starts healing, he starts preaching. No, what's the first thing that happens? He goes to the wilderness. He goes to the wilderness for 40 days, fast for 40 days, is tempted from the enemy. Hey guys, there's a lesson in that. That before public ministry can happen that God uses us, there is the crucible of what happens in the private. There is the crucible of overcoming temptation and sin. There is the crucible of learning to depend on God for our very food, for our identity, for what we are, that the enemy will try to give us shortcuts to try to find our sense of significance, to find what we want. And, he, and he's willing to give it to us. But if we really desire to be used of God, that's the first thing that starts with ministry. So sometimes, man, I don't know where you're at tonight, but maybe tonight you're like, man, I have these visions of how I want God to use me. But maybe you feel like you're in a little bit of a wilderness experience, that you're struggling with trying to overcome some temptations, that you're trying to learn to hear God's voice, and you feel it's because I'm not good enough. It's be, you fill in the blank, whatever the reason is. Hey, you know what? If that was the pathway for Jesus, why would it be any different for us? There are things that have to be learned in the wilderness that we have to be able to depend on God so that when we get into the public arena that we are able to depend on God and God can use us and we can be trusted. Otherwise, if we go into the public arena of ministry and those things are not taken care of, guess what's gonna happen? We're gonna fail in the public arena and it's not just gonna be our reputation, it's gonna be God's reputation. So if God has put you in a wilderness for a little bit, I want to encourage you. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's an invitation to work some things out so that when you step into that more public arena of what God wants to take you into, that your roots have gone deep enough to be able to handle the fruit, that it doesn't break the branches or topple the tree. Okay? Blessing. All right. So now we're at 114. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee <coughs> preaching the gospel. What is gospel? Good news. So he came preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. And he says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. I just want to stop there. There's just a time when God wants to capitalize on things in our life. 
There's a time when good news is everything. And this is what it's like to follow Jesus is first of all, is to just hear the good news. And the good news is that there is a kingdom of God that is different from the kingdom of this world. And this world tries to suck us into its kingdom dynamics and its culture and its way of doing things. And we have grown up in that. And we have been unsatisfied. And we have been broken. And we've tried to serve ourselves. And this kingdom that, we, that, that is presented to us is not working. And this is why Jesus said, the time is now, it's fulfilled. This is it. This is the moment. And the kingdom of God is here. It's right here. It's at hand. It's close enough to reach out, but you've got to reach out to it. You've got, you have to, it's right there, but you've got to take this step into it. And I think that that would be the first thing that the, that we could learn that this is what Peter's recording, that he's remembering Jesus showing up. He's remembering his life and trying to live under the rules of Judaism and everything that was going on in Roman rule. We don't have time to go into that, but it was, there was just a ton of stuff going on. And Jesus comes on the scene and he's like, guys, this is it. This is the time. The good news is now. The kingdom of God is right here. Will you step into it? Same thing for us tonight. The kingdom of God is here. It is present. The time is now. Will you step into it? Repent and believe the good news. What's repent? Repent isn't just being sorry. A lot of people are sorry, guys. They're sorry, but they don't make a change. That's not repentance. Repentance. The very meaning of the word repent is that you're going this way. To repent means that you go this way. So it's not a feeling, there, there, there can be, an, there is an emotion attached to that, that we feel sorry. But guys, feeling sorry is the stillbirth of repentance until action takes place. It does not, it, it is not, repentance is not fulfilled until the direction is changed. To be emotional about it, to be emotional about it, does not make a change. And you probably have been wronged by people that you've had to confront in your life that have felt, have felt, have felt bad about what they did to you. Genuinely really felt bad. But they weren't willing to change what they were doing. And you know what that's like. Now, in order this kingdom is at hand, what does it mean to step into it? Well, it's two things right here. One is to believe, to believe that Jesus is who he says he is and what he came for. And two is to repent, to stop trying to walk the way of the world, but walk into the kingdom of God. And this is the whole thing, you know, a part of what I really feel like the Lord is wanting us to really focus on tonight is too often, I think, in Western Christianity, we have equated becoming a Christian to praying a prayer. That we will pray a prayer, ask God to forgive our sins, say that we believe in Jesus, and that's what makes us a Christian. Now, that is certainly part of what makes us a Christian. But what you're gonna find out here <coughs> is that God has so much more than that. The invitation is not just to be a Christian. The invitation is much greater than that. It's to follow Jesus. It's to follow Jesus. Well, let's look at this. So first of all, we need to know what the message is. It's the kingdom of God. The time is now. Step into it. Let's repent. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, 16, remember this is Peter's story. So he's recalling. You know, these are the first things he's thinking about. He's probably, for some reason, Mark was impacted so much that this is what he leads his gospel with. You know, he's going to talk about the wilderness, but Jesus coming on the scene, what's the first thing that happens? He preaches, and the very next breath, and he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he sees Simon and Andrew's brother casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. You guys ever seen that? It's the coolest thing. When I lived in Hawaii... 
A lot of people fish like this. You know, they had a net that had weights all the way around it. And you would tie, you'd like wrap it up in a certain way so that when you go out, you could throw it and it would completely expand around, drop down, and then you would catch the fish, drag it in, and that's how you would catch your fish. So these guys are literally casting their nets. They are mid-cast when Jesus comes up to talk to them. And what does he say? 17, and Jesus said to them what? Follow me. It's interesting, he didn't say, believe in me. Get your theology right. What does he say? Follow me. And I love this next phrase. And I will make you what? But it doesn't just say, I will make you fishers of men. It says, I will make you what? I will make you become fishers of men. You see, I think too often our expectation is that when we begin to follow Jesus and trust Jesus, that we're just going to have it all together. We've made this choice. Our life should be, should be good now. I should know exactly what to do. But what did Jesus say? I will make you become fishers of men. It's a process. So the question is, what was the call? It wasn't to pray a prayer. It was to what? Drew, can you stand up for a sec? Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. And as we follow, we're probably talking and living life. This is it. Guys, I want this to like sink in our head. This is what it means to follow Jesus. It's not like going to church. That's important. It's not just praying or believing a certain thing. He's like, should I still be doing this? Yes, follow me. Follow me. So what is it? It's wherever Jesus goes, we go. Thank you, Drew. I, I pray that this, that image sticks in your head. Christianity is not about praying a prayer or believing a right creed. We aren't following a creed. We're following a person. Jesus says, follow me. Why, am I, why are we so excited about being in the gospel? Because by seeing Jesus, we know what God is like. We can know who God is. And so when Jesus says, follow me, what does that mean? Now, stay right here and either turn or click to 314, Mark 314. So he calls these guys and he calls James and John, the Thunder Boys, in just a second. <clears throat> but when he actually appoints the apostles, I want you to see this. This is really, really powerful. Somebody read out 314 for me, nice and loud. Who's got it? Okay, you don't need to read the names, but we, okay, so we got, he sent out apostles, which means sent ones, and he was going, that they were going to cast out demons, they were going to do these crazy things, which we see that, but what was the first thing before that? That they might be What? Guys, this is what it means to follow Jesus. The first thing is that we might be with him. It's a personal call. I remember what that was like for me. I mean, I'd grown up in the church. I accepted Christ when I was five. You know, my dad moved up here to Northern California. He was a hippie. He actually moved up here to grow pot. And so, uh, you know, planted his first crop, walked out one day before open range laws, a whole herd of cows had come in and he, they munched his whole crop down to nothing. And so that's my line, happy cows come from California. And so <laughs> he replants again. And right before that, right before he's getting ready to harvest, he goes down to make some contacts and some of his drug buddies had got saved. And my dad just gets radically saved. I came to Christ 
laying in my bed, listening in the living room to my dad and a friend talk about how Christ had changed their lives. And at five years old, I walked out and said, I I need Jesus in my heart. I need Jesus in my life. And I grew up in the church to that point. But there was a point when I was a junior in high school where my parents decided that the Lord had spoke to them that they should go to the mission field. And it was in Hawaii, which I think everybody goes, oh yeah, go suffer for Jesus in Hawaii. (laughs) But I will be honest with you, I was not excited about it. I was leaving my friends, I was leaving, uh, there was a lot that I felt was here that we were leaving for, and I was actually really pissed about it. Because I was like, you know, what is this that God told us to go? I mean, God didn't say anything to me. And so, you know, what is this stuff God told me to do this, or God told me to do that? And I remember going into my room, locking the door, and I just said, I will not leave here until you talk to me. I, you know, I, I, I'm not going to leave here. And I remember reading the whole book of 1 Corinthians. It was like reading, it wasn't even a biology book. That would be more exciting. It would be like reading a trigonometry book that you had no clue what it was. It was just like nothing. And then I went in, and as I got into, into 2 Corinthians, all of a sudden, the, it just, the Lord just began to spoke, speak to me. And he was like, I want your heart. I want all of you. And there was this like intense moment where I knew that God was, was asking me for my whole life, for my future. And I knew that he was gonna keep pursuing me and I could, either, I could either give up now and give up everything that I thought it was or he was gonna keep pursuing me to the end of my life and the stakes were only gonna get higher and there was gonna be more to lose. And I just knew that in my heart. But it was personal. It was like, I want you to follow me. I want your life. And this is what it means to follow Jesus. That the Lord speaks to you personally and says, I want you to follow me. I want you. But it's not even about what you're doing yet. It's that you be with him, that you follow him, that you follow a person, that you've been appointed to be with him. You know what, guys? Sometimes we get away from that. Sometimes we make it about casting out demons, sharing the good news, and we get away from the first thing. And the first thing is just to be with him. Because the bottom line is, we have got no power to do any of that other stuff. I can't heal anybody. I don't have the wisdom to be able to, on my own, figure things out. I can't even figure myself out. Anybody else raise their hand on that? It's hard enough to try to figure yourself out, let alone anything else. Only he knows that. And it's by us being with him and him personally calling us. That's where everything flows out of. When we get away from that, when we get away from following Jesus and we're following a set of rules that we feel like defines us being a good Christian or we follow somebody else's call because we're looking at what they're doing and going, I really want to be able to do that. Guys, it it is really as simple as follow me. And he called them to be with him. That's where it all starts. Now, when you're with him, he's going to do some crazy stuff. And and it's it's going to be a ride. It's going to be a ride. And so that's what happens. You will become fishers of men. It doesn't happen overnight. We're just with him and we change as we go. We change as we go. He changes us. So they immediately left their nets and followed him. He got a little further. He saw James, son of Zebedee, John. They were in their boat mending the nets. (coughs) So some people are fishing, some people are mending. And so then what else does it mean to follow Jesus? Well, 21. Then they went into Capernaum And immediately on the what? Sabbath, Sabbath, he entered where? Synagogue, which means the gathering, and he taught. So when you follow Jesus and you're with him, immediately, one of the things about following Jesus is you're gonna be part of the gathering. You're gonna be part of honoring Sabbath. What is Sabbath? It is time with God. And... Although in the Old Testament, Sabbath was a day, now Jesus is our Sabbath. We have Sabbath all the time because of Jesus. 
But it's being with him that gives us that. And it's being a part of the gathering of the synagogue of coming together. So that's part of what it means to follow Jesus immediately. So he calls them. What's the first thing they do? They go and they're a part of the synagogue. That's why, I, guys, I'm just telling you, I, I cannot buy scripturally people that say, I love Jesus, but I just have a problem with the church. It's just not biblical. It's not biblical. The church is people. If, if God calls people to himself, people are gonna be seeking fellowship with other people. And you know what? We're a mess. That's just part of the deal. We get on each other's nerves. We do things to each other that we shouldn't. That's just part of it, and that's part of the growth process. But that's part of what it means to follow Jesus, is that we're part of that gathering, that we're part of Sabbathing together, of finding our rest and our peace in Jesus together. From there, what happens? Well, we'll look, first of all, look at 22. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having what? What does it say? Authority. So that's the other thing, is that his word finds authority in our lives. Before, we have been the authority in our lives. We have decided what we're going to do based on how we feel, or what our friends say, or what our family says. And now, all of a sudden, we have a different structure of authority. He teaches us as having authority because he is authority. And so his word finds authority in our lives. And that's why we need to be in the word. Because that's the, ultimate, that's the ultimate decision maker of what our lives should look like. That he teaches us from his word and he has authority, not like religion. Not like religion. Sometimes we can get into like church kind of stuff and sometimes church stuff is not building intimacy if our heart is not right to be with Jesus. Jesus. We can be going through the motions and missing it. Now, does that mean we shouldn't be a part of that? No, we just saw that we're supposed to be a part of it. But it means that we need to shepherd and steward our hearts that his word is finding authority so that we can be in a place that when we're in, in fellowship together, that our hearts are being disciplined, submitted to God so that we can be what we need to be to one another. Instead of setting the standard of, oh, I don't, I don't want to be with them because they look funny, because they talk weird, because they looked at me the wrong way. Fill in the blank. A couple other things. <clears throat> 123. Now again, this is Peter. Think about it. It's like his first day on the job. It's like his first day at school. He's following Jesus. They go to the synagogue. They're, he's finding that there is an authority that he's never lived by by what Jesus teaches from the word of God. The next thing, 123, while he's there, okay, you would think this is kind of the wrong place for this to be happening in church. Everybody always says, oh, church is full of a bunch of hypocrites. Well, look at this. There was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. <laughs> what? You know? Well, the synagogue or the church or the gathering should be the place where everybody can come. We don't all have to be perfect to come here. We come with our mess. And yet the presence of God touches us here. And what does he do? He cried out, let us alone. Can you imagine what this? I mean, how would you have liked tonight while Justin was leading worship if seven hours, what do you have to do with that? You know, I mean, you would be like, what's going on? I need to leave here. And this is exactly what happened. Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked to him, basically saying, be muzzled, get out of him. And the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice and he came out of him. And they're amazed and they questioned him. What is this doctrine for with authority he commands unclean spirits? And they obey him. What does it mean to follow Jesus? That we engage spiritual warfare and that the power of God defeats what the enemy holds us in bondage to. And you know what? This bondage was right in church. It was right in church. So we should not be surprised when we come to church and things aren't the way we want them to be. And we're like, oh, I don't know that I can go to that church. The, the point is, are we with Jesus? That's where it starts. The point is, is, his, is he having authority? And when we're with him and following him, he is going to confront darkness. 
because he is light. And he's going to confront the darkness in our own life. And that's uncomfortable. We don't like that when, when we get exposed. Nobody likes that. But it's also the way that we become healthy. It's also the way that he's like, the Lord, Jesus is like, man, I've got a better life for you. You thought the ultimate was fish? I have a better life for you. Now, we all have, you fill in the blank. For Peter and for James and John, it was fish. And we kind of snicker. <laughs> you know what? We have the same thing that in the light of who Jesus is and his authority, it's as ridiculous to us as we look at fish for them. He is, he is that magnificent. And he's going to confront that. He's going to confront it in our own lives. Guys, we have a ministry here. It's called VMTC. It's an acronym for Victorious Ministries Through Christ. <clears throat> and we often will spend, when we do a prayer ministry session with someone, it's five, four, five, six hours. And that seems like, oh my gosh, how do you do that? But essentially what you do is you kind of go through this checklist and you identify anything in your life that has kept you from getting closer to Jesus. And as you walk in biblical principles to confess this sin and you confess it and then we pray, the power of the enemy is broken. The first time I did this personally, and I'd grown up in the church, I walked out of, I walked out of a ministry session where I've been prayed for and it physically impacted my eyesight. Now, I knew that spiritual things could impact physical things. I mean, I know that sometimes when we have unforgiveness, we can be sick. I mean, these were not new concepts to me. But it was a new concept to think that this would happen in my own life. And I remember walking out thinking like somebody had just taken Windex to my eyes. And I walked out and I was like, I see clearer. I see with more vibrant colors. How is it that something spiritual of coming clean impacted my physical sight? That was crazy to me. You know what? The enemy is a liar, and he tricks us. And he tricks us into bitterness and unforgiveness. And he tricks us into ways that we handle our romantic relationships, that we try to pattern the world instead of following his blueprint. He tricks us into things that are supernatural, that we watch things, that we get... We love to be scared or we love to look at supernatural stuff. I mean, I, I've prayed with people that just in fun dabbled with Ouija bo boards or like the Bloody Mary thing. And then you know what? Demonic stuff started showing up in their house and moving things around. That stuff is real. But when we follow Jesus, he comes, First John says this, that Jesus come to destroy the works of the devil. He came to destroy the works of the devil. So part of following Jesus is not just being with him. It's his word following. It's, it's his word finding authority in our lives. It's us being in community. But it's also spiritual warfare. It's, the Lord, it's Jesus taking care of those things that the enemy is trying to hold us and trap to, to try to destroy our lives. You see, we all know that Jesus loves us and has a wonderful plan for our life. Hey, I got news for you. The devil also has a plan for your life. He absolutely has a plan for your life. And it's to kill, to steal, and to destroy, like John 10.10 10 says. And, and he wants to do that just purely because he hates God and he knows that God loves you. And so we have to be serious about those things. That's part of what following Jesus is, is that following and being with him as he takes care of that kind of stuff. Two last things. Um, 29. As soon as they came out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Think about this. This is all just like one breath. This is like his first day. You know what I mean? This is his first memories. What is this like to follow Jesus? This is so cool. And so he came, oh, sorry, 30, but Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever and they told him about her at once. So he came and took her by the hand. What a beautiful picture lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. The Lord heals us. Following Jesus means that his healing is there in our lives, and he heals us so that we can serve other people. It's a beautiful thing. Well, guess what? If he's going to heal us, what does that mean? 
is that sometimes we're sick. And you know what? We were talking about this this morning in high sight. First Peter talks about a lot about suffering. <clears throat> and we always think that when we're suffering that something's wrong. That God must, we must have done something wrong or God isn't happy with us and so we're suffering. Honestly, guys, how much is in our hearts really to seek God when we have everything we want? We are so content with ourselves and what we can control. We don't understand that often suffering and different things that are happening are actually a gift and an invitation so that the power of God and the reality of God can be made real in our lives, that we would never know the depth of who God is except for that to happen in our lives. And we think that there's something wrong when it happens. When in reality, it's the very seedbed for us to be able to desire God and to know God in a way we would never know him if we didn't experience that. And so I want to encourage you now, are you going through something? It doesn't mean that something is wrong with you. Now, sometimes there are consequences that we reap because of what we sow. But you know what? Suffering is an invitation into the heart of God for him to show you who he is. It's an invitation into a longing for God that is greater than what we, than what we know. It's what C.S. Lewis says. We're content to making mud pies in a mud puddle and we can't even imagine that there's a vacation by the sea. We're content with where we are in the mud puddle. It's these things that drive us to be able to want something more, to long for something more in our hearts. And so his healing comes to us. And he comes so that when he gives us that, we have something to share, that we can genuinely give something of substance to other people. That is amazing. <clears throat> the last thing I want to end with is this. So he heals everybody in 132. Casts out demons, 135. This is where we'll end tonight. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he, Jesus, and he went out and departed to a solitary place. And there he what? Even Jesus modeled what it's like to develop a relationship with God. That he got up away from the crowds. Honestly, Everybody gets up looking for him. Why? Because he's healing everybody. He's casting out demons. You would kind of be thinking, this is like the kingdom. You know, this, we're rolling here on the kingdom. Let's keep going on this. But he gets up early before anybody's up to go get away to be with the Father, to seek the Father. Because he understood that just as he called people to be with him, he needed to be with the Father. And so we end with where we started, 36. And Simon and those who were with him, they what? They searched for him. And you know what? Some people search for Jesus, and when they can't find him, they just stop looking. But what are we called to? We're called to follow. We're called to be with him. And one thing I love about Peter is he didn't stop looking. 37, and when they what? When they what? When they found him. What did they say? Everyone is looking for you. Was everyone really looking for him? A lot of people stopped the search. But you know what? Peter kept looking. He wasn't gonna be satisfied until he found Jesus. And Jesus said, hey, we need to go to other towns to do what the Father's calling me to do. So we end where we started with him following him finding him being with him guys as we leave here tonight I just want to ask you some of us have been in church a long time let me rephrase it are we really following Jesus 
I mean, are we really following? Have we reduced it to believing some creed, to saying some prayer? Are we longing for him? Are we following him? Is it to be with him? Is it to go find him? Now, when we go and we find him, he's going to take us into the gathering. He's going to take us into his authority. He's going to take us into his healing. He's going to take us into spiritual warfare. But it's going to be because we follow him. It's because we're following the person of who he is. That's where the power comes from. It's not from some magic prayer. It's from his person. That's where the authority comes from. That's where the, that's where the wisdom comes from. It's from him. So bow your heads with me. And as Justin comes up, <clears throat> it's a great opportunity for us tonight to just kind of dialogue with the Lord as we worship in song, to reframe some things. And this is good news, guys. This is, this is Peter, you know, after not only walking through all of his failures, but his comebacks and everything that God's been doing in Rome and now going through persecution. And as he's been telling and preaching, Mark's recollection of this is talk about this first. Talk about being with him first, following him first, immediately. Staying on his tail. Jesus, bring us back to first love. Bring us back to what we see here. It's good news. It's, it's just you. It's you bringing the kingdom. It's here. We can step into it. Lord, I, I just confess that sometimes... I am content to play church. But there is an authority with you. There's a power with you. There's a passion with you that's found in your person. And without that, our gatherings are, are shallow. That's not a reflection on the gathering. It's a reflection on our own hearts. So God, make us long for you. And that's a dangerous prayer because sometimes that means we're inviting suffering. We're inviting difficulty. But God, we want to long for you. We want to find you and chase you. And when everybody else gives up the hunt, that we're still looking, that we find you, that, we, that our purpose is repurposed. You will make us something different than what we were. We will become something different. And you tell us what to do next when we follow you. Oh, it's time to go somewhere else. Everything makes sense to stay here and keep doing this, but we're going somewhere else. Lord, we need that voice with us, behind us, whispering to us, this is the way, walk in it. Lord, make us crave that more than anything, to crave your voice, to crave your presence. You're leading. We talk about that every week. That Haven is about the, following the leading of the Holy Spirit. The mission of Jesus. The authority of the word of God. Lord, make that more than a... Um, not a byline, more than a mission statement. Make that our... Make that what we breathe, what we crave. In Jesus' name.